malignant bone lesions and then a little talk on reconstruction options in both upper limb and lower limb. We have a separate talk on GCT uh, and then if you guys are up for it, then we can also do a soft tissue sarcoma talk as well. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, one thing, sir, uh, in the exam, most of the examiner uh, asks uh, about the chemotherapy agents for uh, osteosarcoma and the Ewing sarcoma. There is a okay. lot of confusion between these two uh, uh, these two cancers, uh, chemotherapy agents. Mm. What will be the ideal chemotherapy agents should we tell to the examiner in the, in the big stage? When we come to the discussion uh, about the management of primary malignant bone lesions, that's where I'll mention all of these to you. Um, okay. Now, okay, fine. Not to go into specific details of every single uh, chemotherapeutic agent, but I think for exam purposes, perhaps it's best for all of you uh, that you remember at least one important side effect of these common chemotherapy agents. Okay. Uh, and if you remember one, I think your examiners in FCPS expect you to tell them about one common side effect. Like for instance, methotrexate is a common one uh, and it causes aplastic anemia. It causes folate deficiency or folate inhibition. Uh, doxorubicin is another very common one. It causes doc, uh, cardiotoxicity. So, Isitara, if you remember just one side effect of uh, all of these, uh, then you should be okay. May, uh, I, I am asking the regime, the ideal regime for the these tumors, these two tumors only. We will discuss all of those. We will discuss. All okay, those. okay. Don't worry. Hopefully, inshallah, by the time you leave this session. Uh, you should be over flooded with oncology and you should be competent and confident in tackling any question in your exam. Okay, fine, sir. I think we'll wait for another minute or so and then we'll start. Yes. All of the participants hear me. Uh, there's a Dr. Yunus Nunari. Can you hear me? People to join. You've already got an audience of seven years. Ishan, that's not bad. Okay, so okay. while you're joining this, um, mm -hmm. I am recording this. So hopefully, you won't miss anything. If you do miss it, I'll put everything on the forum for you guys to see. Okay. However, uh, so if you have the stamina, right? If you guys mm -hmm. have the stamina, at, at 10 o'clock Pakistan time, I can do a talk on CP, and then tomorrow morning yeah. we'll do gate. If that's okay with you guys. Absolutely fine, sir. It is 7 p.m. here. Yes, I know. Uh, Zishan Saab is going to tire you out for the next 45 minutes to an hour, like, isn't it? So once you finish with him, I'll give you an hour's break. Okay, I'll give you an hour's break and you can all uh, have a nice little break and come back again and we'll talk about CP. Because somebody asked me yesterday yeah. to do CP and GATE. So I have a talk on CP and GATE. I'll do the talk and GATE, uh, CP today and then GATE tomorrow, okay? So Zishan Saab, you can start if you want to. Whoever no. misses can always join on the video then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Most of uh, our examiner here uh, tell us that CP would not be in the exam in the long case or the short case. Okay, then well, we don't do CP then. Yeah. We can do gate then, yeah? Yeah. Fine. Well, no, you you may have there, CP yeah. on, your, on your table, isn't it? You may have a picture of a CP to, to talk about. It's only a 15 minutes talk. We can go through it if you want okay, to. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, shall we start then, yes? Yes, please, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so... Slideshow, right. Can you all see the slideshow now, right? Yes, sir. We can see the slide, sir. Okay. So, can anyone define for me what is a sarcoma? I like things being a bit interactive rather than me just talking all the way through. Can anyone define what's a sarcoma? Sarcoma is a... Uh... Uh, abnormal develop uh, abnormal mitosis of the mesenchymal cells. Abnormal. Okay. 
any better definition than this? Um, any? So it is a malignant tumor originating from the mesenchymal germ cell layer. So all the embryonal germ layers, the three ones, uh, so it's the mesoderm, all the connective tissues that originates from the mesoderm. If there is a malignancy of the mesoderm germ layer, that's called a sarcoma. So in essence, you're dealing with bone, soft tissues, fats, neurovascular structures, cartilage, adipose tissue. So all these tumors originating are called sarcomas. Uh, and the word sarcoma means a fleshy growth. And as we've already discussed, it originates from all the mesodermal germ layers. Uh, so what is an orthopedic oncologist? What is your role in sarcoma management? You're basically part of a multidisciplinary team. And I'd suggest to all the trainees that whenever you mention uh, the management of uh, a sarcoma, in any of your cases, please mention an MDT or a tumor board. A lot of people in Pakistan call this a tumor board. So whichever term you use is absolutely fine. And a tumor board is composed of a, a, an oncologist. Uh, you should have a medical and a radiation oncologist. You should have a musculoskeletal radiologist, a pathologist who's trained and skilled in uh, musculoskeletal pathology. You may need a plastic surgeon, a physiotherapist, and you may need to involve your theater support team for planning. Now, by definition, you should have two of each of those for you to legally have an MDT, okay? Uh, so usually it's the orthopedic oncologist who leads this tumor board, but any of the team members can actually lead this team. So it is very important to mention the role of a multidisciplinary team because you're not the only one who's in charge of uh, all these patients. So next question or the next few questions are, how can cancer present to an orthopedic surgeon and what are the salient features in history taking of orthopedic malignancy and what treatment options are available for these bone and soft tissue tumors? And the next important question is, does it matter who actually deals with these patients with sarcomas? So a study uh, done in 1997 found that a significant number of patients had inadequate uh, surgery when they were treated by general orthopedic surgeons. It is actually very important and you only have a first or a single go at the management of these tumors because if you do not clear these tumors clearly, then uh, you run the high risk of recurrence. Whenever you have recurrence, the chances of survivorship decreases with every recurrence. So it is important that they're dealt by uh, a surgeon, not necessarily just an orthopedic surgeon, but by a surgeon who's skilled and trained in sarcoma surgery. So what are the problems with musculoskeletal tumors? Uh, we see quite often that there's a delay in diagnosis. Lots of these patients will come in with totally inappropriate investigation. So you might need an MRI scan or a CT scan. And on, on the contrary, this patient may have had an ultrasound scan, which is totally useless uh, to a, a sarcoma surgeon. And I see quite often that these patients have had inadvertent treatment, half-hearted attempts uh, by uh, generalists uh, coming in with uh, abnormally placed scars and abnormal excisions. And these patients quite often have not had proper assessments. It is very important. And in all fairness, this is inexcusable and indefensible. And it, within the very near future in Pakistan, you might notice that the medical litig litigation culture will come in in high time. Uh, so it will be very important for the subspecialists uh, to be dealing with these things. So another common term that you all of you need to be aware of is a red flag sign. Now, by definition, a red flag sign means anything that is worrying. So that could be anything in the history, that could be anything in the examination or in the investigations. So use these terms uh, or what we used to call them as buzzwords in your exam because these are the ones which will clinch you marks. So just mention the word red flags. Now, what are the red flag signs in spine? So another important information for you when you're uh, doing your OPDs with patients. So if you have a patient who's above the age of 50 or younger, 
than 20 and they have an acute onset back pain, that is a red flag. So you have to investigate these patients. They may have something worrying. Or if this patient has a previous history of cancer, because spinal mats are quite common. And if these patients come in with associated systemic features, such as uh, weight loss, fevers, chills, again, these are red flags. And if this pain worsens when the patient is lying flat supine or there is nighttime pain or dorsal spine pain, again, these are worrying. And this was taken from uh, an article which was published in the BMJ in 2003. So red flags in spine, you need to remember this, not just for your exam, but also for your practice. What could be the red flags in children? So if a child comes with an unexplained joint swelling, if there is tenderness to palpation with no preceding history of trauma, there's muscle weakness, if there is any deviation in the growth curve or any unexplained pain. Now also remember which, what is very important is the term growing pains. Uh, we quite often see, say to our patients in OPDs that this child is growing up, that's why they're having pain. Now, growing pain is a diagnosis of exclusion, and that is something which you should only tell them after you've thoroughly investigated your patient by examination, investigation, and uh, history taking. So what could be the red flags in the limbs if there is a history of cancer? If there are any signs and symptoms of a cancer anywhere else, if there is an unexplained deformity, if there is any functional pain or pain at rest, and quite obviously if there is a mass or swelling, what could be the red flag features when it comes to soft tissue lumps? Now in the UK, we used to uh, use the term golf ball size lump. Now, if you measure a golf ball, it measures, I think if I'm not wrong, 4.6 centimeters in diameter. So any lump that is bigger than a golf ball, or for all practical purposes, anything bigger than five centimeters, anything that is deep to the deep fascia, if it is painful and enlarging, any of these features, if you see them in a soft tissue lump, you should automatically think of a sarcoma and you need to rule out that this may or may not be a sarcoma. So if all four of these features are present in a soft tissue lump, the positive predictive value of this being a sarcoma is close to 90%. So that's quite high. And every single one of them has a positive predictive value of around 20%, as you can see on these statistics. So I'm just going to take you back to that slide. These are the four important features that you need to remember in soft tissue lumps. So just to recap, anything bigger than five centimeters, deep to deep fascia, if it is painful and enlarging, think of a sarcoma. This is a table of how these uh, tumors can present to you. And more often than not, it is a mass in the form of a mass that they present to you, but they can present with pain, they can present with fractures or systemic features as well. Now have a look at this uh, X-ray or a radiograph of a left distal femur and you can uh, very obviously see that the fracture pattern is completely atypical. It is not a typical fracture and this was um, not associated with any uh, significant trauma. This patient had preceding history of pain with this and this actually turned out to be a myeloma. Now. What if you have a patient who's above the age of 40 and they come to you with a bony lesion? What are the three or four important things that should come automatically to your mind? First of all, metastases. Second, myeloma. Third, infection. Now, infection may not be as common or prevalent in a patient above the age of 40, but it is always in the list of differentials uh, of a bony lesion. So always remember, any patient above the age of 40 mets myeloma and also rule out infection. Now, whenever you see a pathological fracture, what should you do? Take a detailed history like we do. These cases are no different than any others. And you should examine these patients thoroughly from head to toe. Every single orifice has to be examined. Now, what are the investigations after you've uh, uh, taken a history of these patients. So always remember a plain radiograph of the whole bone. 
a bone scan. Uh, we also may or may not need a PET CT, CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis because these are the commonest areas where uh, a metastasis may originate from. And an MRI of that area of the bone which is involved. So let's suppose in that previous case of distal femur, you need to arrange an MRI scan of the whole femur with contrast from knee to the hip joint. So this is an important clinical tip because you want to uh, make sure that there are no skip lesions. Now, when it comes to exams, I think the best way to deal with a question would be to mention the term staging. And when it comes to staging, there is local staging and systemic staging. Now, what does local staging mean? Local staging means the involvement of the local structures by the tumor, and you're looking for involvement of bone, muscle compartments, neurovascular structures, any skip lesions, because these are the things which you will need to determine whether you can do limb salvage or not. And when it comes to systemic staging, you need to do a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and you may need to uh, integrate those with an isotope bone scan. So again, important to remember the buzzwords. So I would say, if you come across this scenario, just say, I would like to stage these patients. I would do local staging and systemic staging. Now, blood tests, uh, you will need to do your basic blood tests. And in certain scenarios, you might need to add some other markers. So for instance, you have a patient who's above the age of 60, a male patient who's come with a pathological fracture, which is sclerotic looking. You need to be thinking of metastatic fracture secondary to prostate cancer. So in those scenarios, you might need to add a PSA. Um, and for myeloma, we all know about the routine workup. You ask for serum protein electrophoresis, a urine for Ben Jones proteins. These patients are usually anemic. Their ESR is elevated and you complement that with a bone marrow aspirate uh, for further discussion. Now, if you have a pathological fracture and you're not sure whether it is pathological or not, or if you don't know what to do with it, the best thing to do is to get advice and phone a friend who knows how to deal with them. Now, thankfully, I think over the last couple of years in Pakistan, in every major uh, city of all the provinces, you have one or two oncology surgeons who can guide you what to do with them. The next thing is to get a histological diagnosis and the biopsy is the gold standard for it. Now never hesitate from doing a biopsy uh, because uh, as the great man Henry Menken himself said that you will never be blamed for doing a biopsy, but you will be if you don't. So if you're in doubt, get a biopsy and as a rule of thumb, anything that you biopsy, a sample should also go for cultures. And anything that you culture, the sample must go for biopsy. Uh, we'll talk about the sarcoma principles in another quick talk. Uh, now, if you have a, a metastatic fracture, how should you deal with them? Uh, so this talk is mainly going to focus on metastatic disease. Now, any treatment depends on the prognosis of the patient. And the prognosis of this patient is established in the tumor board or a multidisciplinary team. Uh, as a general rule, just remember, if your patient's survivorship is less than six to eight weeks, do not operate on these patients. They just need palliative pain relief, which may be in the form of radiotherapy. If your patient's survivorship is more than that, less than 12 months, so remember, more than six to eight weeks, but less than 12 months, you need to fix this fracture. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this can be in the form of uh, curettage, cementoplasty, uh, plating, or nailing. It's, it, it could be either or. But if your survivorship is more than 12 months, then your fixation is not going to last the lifetime of this patient, and it is eventually going to fail. So if your economic circumstances allow you, then consider doing a resection and reconstruction with a megaprosthesis. So important to understand, less than six weeks, less than six weeks, no need of surgery, more than six weeks, but less than 12 months surgery in the form of reconstruction, more than 12 months in the form of replacement. 
And whenever you put in a nail, remember that whilst you're reaming through, you're spreading the tumor cells throughout the bone. So consider post-operative radiotherapy after you've nailed a pathological fracture. So we've already discussed these options. These are some of them which one can use for pathological fracture secondary to metastases. Now, also remember that a fracture, a pathological fracture is not a contraindication to limb salvage surgery. Um, I wrote a review article on this, which was published in the uh, Journal of Bone and Soft Tissue Tumors. It's a nice review of the literature um, and actually, the indications in this case are exactly similar to um, another musculoskeletal tumor. Uh, here you go. This is mentioned. So in case you're interested to read that, this is a nice, easy read, uh, a few pages. Now, what is uh, the role of an orthopedic surgeon in the management of metastatic bone disease? Uh, so A is to diagnose uh, by getting histological uh, specimen for diagnosis biopsy. Now we need to relieve pain, restore function. And if there is a lesion which hasn't fractured yet, then you need to apply the Mirals criteria. And then if it is falling into that category where it needs fixation, then you need to do that prophylactically. Now, orthopedic oncology surgeons generally don't deal with spinal meds, uh, so you may need to involve your spinal surgeon if there are spinal metastases, and they may need to do decompression and stabilization. And as I mentioned, most importantly, whatever you do should last the lifetime of this patient because you don't want this poor patient to come back to your theater again and again. I don't need to go to uh, the details of Mirel's criteria, but you all know that anything more than eight needs fixation. Uh, and the only uh, outlier in this is a lesion in the weight bearing uh, room, uh, even if it's less than seven, and that's the femur. So a femur automatically gets fixed. So coming back to that patient who had that pathological fracture in the distal femur, secondary to myeloma. After discussion in the MDT, our oncologist mentioned to us that this patient will probably live for three to four years. And we already know that even if we nail this, the reconstruction won't last more than 12 months. As, as a matter of principle, what we discussed, this patient underwent a resection and reconstruction with endoprosthesis. And this should see this patient through the lifetime. Various different bone tumors. If you look at the WHO yeah, classification, more yeah. than 50 histological subtypes of uh, sarcomas. Uh, examples of some of them, you can see yeah, that there is a chondroid lesion in the proximal femur in, an, uh, in a 56 years old male patient. You can see some spickled calcification. Yeah, in the and on the MRI, you can see uh, chondroid lesion. So how would you manage this? As we discussed, this patient needs local and systemic staging. To confirm your diagnosis, you need a biopsy. For chondrosarcoma, we all know that they are chemo and radioresistant, apart from a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma or grade three chondrosarcoma. Uh, and the only reason we give them chemotherapy is because they are so aggressive and the survivorship in almost all of them is not more than 12 months. So we give it to them in desperation. And once your patients have had chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you restage them. And by restaging, you get a CT scan of the chest and you get an MRI scan of the limb to see if the tumor has regressed and whether the neurovascular structures are clear followed by surgery. And the aim of surgery in all these cases is to perform limb salvage if possible. And if it isn't possible, then the role of uh, amputation is always there. Now, following resection of the tumor, make sure you send the tumor back to the pathologist because the pathologist will tell you a, about the margins of this tumor, and B, they will also tell you the response of the tumor in terms of post therapy necrosis in percentages. And there's a criteria called the Hugo's criteria. Uh, and if this patient's response has been poor to chemotherapy, they will need adjuvant treatment.
So in general, what are the surgical options uh, for re reconstruction of these tumors? They can be divided grossly into biological and non-biological. The biological one can be in the form of autograft or allograft. These autografts can be vascularized or non-vascularized. We don't have the facility of allograft in Pakistan, but make sure you remember that. Rotation plasty, I'll tell you about this, is an option in lower limb. Now you can also uh, use uh, recycled bone. As you can see in the top left corner where it's mentioned treated bone. This is where you take the tumor bone and you treat it in a particular fashion uh, where the tumor cells are killed and they are re-implanted. We'll talk about this in, a, in another talk uh, in a short while. So, recycled bone and, and or rotation plasty. Non-biological options are in the form of endoprosthesis. Now you can also use a composite type of reconstruction, an allograft prosthetic composite. I'll show you some pictures of this in, the, in, in a few talks after this, but we don't have allografts available in Pakistan, so that's not an option to us. Now contraindications to limb salvage surgery, you need to remember these. Now, uh, one thing I must tell you guys is um, that the things that are mentioned in the books are not always the things that we practice as oncology surgeons. So we bend the rules sometime. So here, the first one that you see in your books uh, and on this slide is the involvement of neurovascular bundle. Now, involvement of the neurovascular bundle is not an absolute contraindication to limb salvage surgery. Because if you have involvement of the vessels, you can do a vascular bypass. If you're skilled, you can do them on your own or you can get your vascular surgeon to help you. For your uh, neurological deficit, you can do tendon transfers or neurotization. But for your exam purpose, you need to mention involvement of neurovascular bundle. Now, if you have a patient who progresses or the disease advances whilst they are on treatment having neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that's a bad prognostic sign. If the patient wishes not to have limb salvage surgery, remember, this is, this, is, this is one of the things that some of the patients will tell you because of their perceived ideas that if you chop off their leg or arm, that the tumor will never come back. And that is completely contradictory to what evidence tells us. Infection is an absolute contraindication to limb salvage surgery. We sometimes see patients who will come in with fungating tumors. In my naivety and uh, sometimes uh, uh, outrageous courageness, I have tried it on a few patients uh, who came in with infected um, tumors and we did limb salvage surgery and I always regretted it. So in my world, the two absolute contraindications to limb salvage surgery are patient choice and an active infection. Pathological fracture is mentioned as a relative contraindication in your books um, and involvement of the joint is a relative contraindication because what you can do is uh, you can do an extra articular resection. You can resect the tumor along with the joint without opening the capsule and still do the reconstruction. So a lot of uh, people talk about survivorship and you might be asked about survivorship. Now survivorship depends on the grade and stage of the disease. Now, I don't need to tell you about grading and staging, you all know that, but higher grade tumors um, obviously are more aggressive and their survivorship will be far lower in comparison to the other ones. And if you have a local disease, the survivorship of this patient is far better than a patient who presents to you with metastases. Now, all of you have seen this picture about resections and clear margins. Um, again, this is available to you in all the books. Uh, just to give you a, a, a quick overview, a marginal excision is the one that you generally do for lipomas. An intralesional excision, I hope you would never do, but intralesional excision is what you do for giant cell tumors or enchondromas. A wide excision is what we normally do in most of the cases. And a radical excision is where you take off the whole compartment or you do an amputation. 
So what is a safe margin? What constitutes a safe margin? Again, as I mentioned, a lot of things uh, are mentioned in the books, which you need to memorize as such for your exam, but in practice, they are completely different. So for us, an intact fascial layer is a clear margin. So if you're doing a tumor, which is a soft, soft tissue tumor, which is involving the interior compartment of the thigh, and it hasn't passed uh, or crossed the lateral intermuscular septum, that septum constitutes a fascial layer. Or if a tumor is lying on top of the blood vessel and you take the tumor off along with the tunica adventitia of the artery, that also constitutes a clear margin. So important to remember what a clear margin is in terms of an intact fascial layer. Now, the books will tell you about five centimeters of clear muscle margin longitudinally. Now, this is not possible in all the cases. For example, you might have a soft tissue tumor in the palm of your hand or in the forearm, and you may not be able to get a five centimeters clear margin. So we do compromise on occasions. But these are things that you need to remember for your exam. And one centimeter radially. If a tumor is lying on top of the bone, and it has not perforated into the bone. You can lift it off with the periosteum. I've got some pictures, clinical, which I'll show you as we proceed. And that constitutes a clear margin. And we've already discussed about adventitia. So what do we re re recommend? That these should be treated with the aim of obtaining clear margins. Only people who are trained in sarcoma surgery should be doing them. There are various guidelines available uh, that should be adhered to when you are dealing with these cases. So this is one example uh, of a skeletally mature patient. And as you can see on the x-ray, I'll just move my cursor. I hope you can see that there is a periosteal reaction here in the proximal metaepiphyseal region. And you can see some periosteal reaction on here. And if you follow this closely, you can actually see a Codman's triangle, which, which is very often mentioned in plain x-rays. And a lateral view shows you periosteal reaction on the other side as well. This is a classical appearance of a giant cell tumor. So if you see one, I'm, and I'm pretty sure you get this in your exams, we have a separate talk about giant cell tumors, but they are always eccentric, they are lytic, they are eccentric, they are juxta-articular, and they are expensile. So remember these five terms, lytic, expensile, juxta-articular, eccentric, and, ex uh, and expensile. So that always constitutes a GCT, as you can see on this MRI scan here as well. Now, sometimes appearances can be a bit doubtful. As you can see on this x-ray here, that you see uh, a patient having some calcification in the soft tissue. Now, this can be synovial osteochondromatosis, but sometimes you see calcifications within the soft tissues in cases of synovial sarcoma. The reason why I put that here is because you need to be sure that what you're dealing with is exactly what it is. And if you're not sure, speak to somebody who knows what it is, or if you're in doubt, get a biopsy. This is a classical appearance of uh, an osteofibrous dysplasia or adamantinoma. The typical location of this is within the tibia. Now, aneurysmal bone cysts. Uh, again, this is another catch. I've seen numerous patients within my practice since I've returned to Pakistan where people have thought that this is an aneurysmal bone cyst and actually it has turned out to be a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So on the plain radiograph here on the top left of your screen, you can see a lytic lesion in the supraacetabular region, as you can see with the cursor. And then on the MRI, you can see multiple fluid fluid levels. Now, this is an aneurysmal bone cyst, but if there was any associated soft tissue component with it, then your index of suspicion for this to be a far worrying lesion should be high. So important, if there is no soft tissue component, then it is an aneurysmal bone cyst, but if there is, be wary that this could be an osteosarcoma. Uh, a skeletally immature patient's radiograph, where you see a heterogeneous lesion, wide zone of transition, periosteal reaction, 
and all these signs are worrying features of an osteosarcoma and an MRI of the same patient showing a large soft tissue component. Uh, again, a worrying lesion of a distal radius, which actually turned out to be a pleomorphic sarcoma. And as you can see on here, there is cortical breach on the volar cortex. And this patient was reconstructed by an Eile crest uh, autograft after excision. You can also reconstruct these by using distal radius endoprosthesis. Now, as I mentioned to you guys earlier, that infection is a common tumor mimicker. So in the list of your differentials, the third or fourth should always be an infection. And as a matter of principle, as I mentioned earlier, anything that you biopsy must go to the microbiologist to rule out infection. And this is a patient who had what we call as a chronic reactive multifocal osteomyelitis or CRMO and has involvement of the uh, <coughs> and left clavicle both sides. So these are some cases just to show you that we can do limb salvage in pathological fractures. This was a 46 years old male, a gardener who had a pathological fracture secondary to chondrosarcoma and we were able to resect and reconstruct with a bipolar head and a megaprosthesis with clear margins. Another patient who had a secondary chondrosarcoma involving the whole of the uh, scapula. And we did a scapulectomy along with extra articular resection of the shoulder joint. As you can see on here, you will not be seeing any of the humerus. And the humerus is suspended from the clavicle in the form of suspensory reconstruction. So just to summarize, history is really important. Red flag features in the history, examination or investigations, you should keep an eye out for them. Plain radiograph is the key, it gives you maximum information. Always remember the words local and systemic staging. Biopsy is the uh, key to your diagnosis. Never assume, if you're in doubt, phone somebody who knows how to deal with them. Aim for cure in primary disease and pain relief. Uh, and function in metastases. And as I mentioned to you earlier, any patient above the age of 40, always think of metastases, myeloma, and infection. This is a slide. I'm pretty sure all of you have seen this uh, in your books. If you haven't, uh, I can see most of you have got your phones on with you. You can take a picture. Uh, and then based on the age of the patient and location of the tumor, uh, you can come up with probable diagnoses or list of differentials. So uh, this was a brief overview um, of musculoskeletal malignancies. Um, I hope I've clarified some of your concerns. If you guys have any questions, I think if Munawar Saab agrees, we can have a five to six minutes question answer session before we proceed to the next talk. I'm stunned. You know, it's amazing how I can relearn everything again. This is, this is good for me too. I remember in my exam, one question was asked by, by um, your boss, you know, Mr. Uh, um, Tillman. And he asked mm -hmm. me at the exam in the FRCS orthopedics long, long time ago is, what is a compartectomy? <laughs> so, so anybody want to have a chat or tell us what is a compartectomy? Uh. Sir, uh, remove uh, excision of the whole compartment, sir, is termed as carpectomy. Okay, so what, what Sujan said, said, you know, that you have to do a total excision, so it, it, a compartectomy can be an amputation or can be a one compartment of, of muscles with its nerve and arteries that you want to remove, or salvage surgery. These are all procedures where you take the whole tumor out, I mean, the compartment which contains the tumor out is called a compartectomy. Yeah? But it's an amazing talk. I, I, I was... I was more here than, than entertaining my guests who are getting worried and... and, and, and yes, yes. One, one, thing for, one thing for the three so days... I have a question before uh, can come back again. Yeah, but thank you very much, Zishan. That was very good. Sir, uh, sir, one area I would like to request uh, Dr. Zishan Saab to uh, some light over that. If there are uh, lung metastases, right. what's uh, the protocol uh, of excision along with the primary surgery, sir. Okay. So, uh, sorry, it's your name Salim, right? 
I mean, the protocol the protocol is exactly the same. You need to stage your patient. You need to do a biopsy in order to get a diagnosis. And then you need to discuss this patient in your tumor board. Now, what happens in real life is that these patients are started on neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They are given two to three cycles. After they've had these cycles, they are re-evaluated to restage them. And depending on their response to chemotherapy, so sometimes there will be a complete resolution. I have operated on a young girl, seven years old, whose face was full of meds. She had Ewing sarcoma of the proximal humerus. And amazingly, I wish I, had, I could show you the x-rays, her chest was completely free of meds following uh, four or five cycles of chemotherapy. So the, the protocol is exactly the same. Now, what if you have uh, metastases that are left uh, following chemotherapy? So if there, is, there are one or two lesions and they are peripherally based, you can ask your thoracic surgeons to do an excision and you proceed with doing whatever surgery you had planned for that limb, which could either be uh, ab ablative surgery in the form of amputation or limb salvage. So the protocol remains exactly the same. But if there are more than two or three uh, chest mets and they are not peripheral and your thoracic surgeon and the MDT disagrees, then you cannot proceed. So in those circumstances, this is the decision based on your experience, based on your socioeconomic and health system, whether you can do limb salvage or not. Now, in my opinion, I would rather let a patient pass away comfortably with their leg rather than taking their leg off. I would spend a couple of hours extra doing limb salvage surgery for them so that they can pass away comfortably with their leg or arm. Does that answer your question? Great, sir. And sir, the size we should mention in exam if it is asked whether the size is important to mention. Yes, so uh, as Munawar Saab mentioned, one of my supervisors who's considered as the godfather of oncology in the world, uh, Professor Rob Grimer, he wrote a paper uh, and the title of it was Size Matters in Sarcomas. It does it in everyday uh, life issues, uh, but in sarcomas they do, and the bigger size tumors fare worse in comparison to smaller size tumors. So it is very important. There was actually a study that was in uh, the Royal Orthopedic Hospital where I trained, and their average size tumor was 11 or 12 centimeters at presentation. The collection that I have, we are averaging at about 15 to 16 centimeters. It is very important. You must all remember, guys, that uh, uh, in Pakistan, people come to doctors late. Okay, so their size is quite bigger. Compared to it, just remembering Rob, Rob, uh, Rob, Rob, I, I used to work for him for six months only, not like here when he had a fellowship with Imzishan, but he used to bring a granny basket when he was on call and he used to give him sandwiches, drink uh, your orange juice, and, 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 and various other things. One question, sir. Sorry? Uh, one question. Uh, if a patient uh, have a metastatic tumor in the diaphyseal area, and uh, on the tumor board, it is decided that his uh, life uh, expectancy is more than two years. Then uh, would, uh, what will be the choice of implant? Because we have to uh, salvage the limb and uh, reconstruct it. So uh, what would be the choice of implant? Excellent. Uh, so now you guys have started thinking. Um, in these kind of scenarios, what you can do is intercalary resection. And there are intercalary prostheses that are available. So they come in two parts. You cement one in the proximal part and cement the other one in the distal part. And they are then connected via strong bolts. So they are called intercalary prostheses. In the modern world, this is what you would do. They are available in Pakistan. Uh, I've used them in a couple of cases here in Pakistan as well. Um, but if you don't have them available, uh, then you might have to, in resource-constrained environments, you might have to bend the rules and do a thorough curettage or a thorough resection, cementation, and then uh, put in a big nail, a thick nail through it, and hope and pray for the best. Okay, so one more question. So you told us about the Ewing sarcoma with chest mats. 
so what is your experience regarding metastatic osteosarcoma with lung meds so does they regress or uh, you have to uh, modify your treatment protocol like that, adjuvants uh, or something dr shabaz that is a very broad question uh the uh, response depends on the grade and aggressiveness of the tumor and the chemotherapy that you use we are now uh, with time seeing that these uh, these uh, tumors although they may be of the similar uh, subtypes but one behaves differently from another one which is why people are talking of genetics and customized chemotherapy uh so the response is variable it depends on subtype and it depends on grade and chemotherapy so that is i think the answer to your question so i, I think we should move on there's got a lot to cover and this stuff has to go like me my my, my guess uh, can ignore me but i think ishan saab is a life isn't it <laughs> <laughs> right uh so can you guys uh, see this new talk now principles of biopsy and types yes, yes sir okay we're going to start the slide show excellent so biopsy again is quite common and uh, it's almost guaranteed that if you are if you have if you get a, a an exam scenario or a question about oncology <laughs> you will be asked about the principles of biopsy so friends come on topic the series to talk this is a uh, this is henry menken uh who has a big name or an a big contribution in the orthopedic oncology world uh, the question you need to ask yourself is when to biopsy now if all of your tests are normal but you still have a suspicion or your diagnosis is in, is in doubt and before you do anything stupid uh, that will make you regret it always biopsy and as we discussed you'll never be blamed for doing a biopsy but you will be if you don't so there are certain lesions uh, which uh, do not need biopsies um, and if you uh, become experienced and you practice oncology uh, as bread and butter you'll be able to identify those lesions so if you see the lesion uh, or the picture on the left side of a skeletally mature patient this is a very well outlined lesion which is benign there's no cortical break there is a narrow zone of transition and the tumor is very well demarcated and actually this is a non ossifying fibroma or a fibrocortical defect and these are the lesions which do not need biopsy now the picture in the middle is again of a skeletally mature patient a pathological fracture as you can see a crack through the cortex on the outer side or the lateral side and a lytic lesion which has got a very narrow zone of transition in the meta epiphyseal region and this is likely to be a simple bone cyst and this is an osteochondroma so there are certain lesions which do not need biopsy okay now who should do the biopsy a surgeon who is experienced in sarcoma surgery surgeon who has a pathologist a musculoskeletal pathologist that we've discussed already and a surgeon who will definitely carry out the surgery okay now most of the times in pakistan that the tumors that we get are so big that we don't need plain radio uh, as we don't need fluoroscopy for biopsies but if you have a tumor in an area which is of difficult access do not hesitate in using fluoroscopy i use fluoroscopy predominantly around the pelvic region for doing my biopsies there was a study which showed that more than 30% of biopsies which were done in a district general hospital were wrong and these biopsies should be done in a tumor center now there are different types of biopsies fnac core needle biopsy open incisional and excisional biopsy and i'm going to talk to you about all of these now bear in mind fnac or a fine needle aspiration cytology has got no role in musculoskeletal pathology although it is mentioned in your books but no bone tumor unit in the world will use fnac for musculoskeletal tumors so that is out for bone lesions we use core needle biopsies and the beauty of a core needle biopsy is that you do it where just a stab incision you get a core through the whole of the lesion so remember or imagine you putting in your bone marrow biopsy needle 
and you take the core from the normal tissue followed by the lesional tissue followed by necrotic tumor if you have any so you take a whole core and this gives a whole spectrum to your pathologist to assess under a microscope now open biopsy again is not unreasonable i tend not to do open biopsies 99.9 percent .9 of all my bone biopsies are core needle all my residents do core needle biopsies because they get trained with us but there are certain scenarios where you may need an open biopsy. For your exam purposes, you need to know about open biopsy. Uh, I think because this is mentioned in your Bible, Campbell, that you read for your exam. So do remember the principles of it. Um, I think the indication for an open biopsy is if you get two negative core needle biopsies, then you need to do an open biopsy to get more tissue. Uh, we recently evaluated our 100 consecutive core needle biopsies and what we found was that we got positive results in 98% of our samples. So that's a very good result. Uh, incisional biopsy, again, uh, should only be done if you, if, uh, for the similar indications as we discussed for open biopsy. For soft tissue tumors, we do true cut biopsy. Again, it is similar to a core needle biopsy because it gives you a whole core, a whole spectrum. <coughs> now, when do you do an excisional biopsy? If you have a tumor which is less than two centimeters in size, okay? So this is important to remember. If you have a soft tissue tumor which is two centimeters or less than that, those are the ones where you cannot get a sample by doing a true cut or a core needle biopsy. Those are the ones where you have to excise the whole tumor and that's where it's called as an excisional biopsy. So principles of, principles of biopsy, a needle biopsy is preferable, longitudinal incision, single compartment violation, there should be no neurovascular violation, meticulous hemostasis, Drain if it is warranted, only if you've done an open biopsy. And as I mentioned in my first talk, always send samples for histopathology and cultures. And biopsy should be performed by the surgeon who will be ultimately performing the surgery. So these are the principles of surgery. Important to remember, if you've got a phone, you can take a picture. I don't mind, but they're mentioned in your books as well. Now, here is a picture on the left side of your screen of a bone marrow biopsy needle, which was traditionally called as a Jamshidi needle. This is what we use for bone biopsies, for core needle biopsies. The picture on the right is of a true cut biopsy needle or the company that sells this to us. Uh, they call this as a monopty needle. This is for true cut biopsy. And again, the beauty of this is that it gives you a whole core. So the pathologist can see the whole spectrum. <coughs> now, if you have a tumor in a difficult access area, as I mentioned, do not hesitate in using a fluoroscopy. If you have a deep seated tumor or it is lying close to an important neurovascular structure, then ask your interventional radiologist who can do ultrasound or CT guided biopsies for you. So again, uh, you need a team uh, as we discussed in the MDT. So a, an interventional radiologist is a helping hand. So if in doubt, use fluoroscopy. There's nothing wrong about it. So for core, core needle biopsies, uh, most of the patients in adults, we are now doing them with local anesthetic, but in younger patients uh, who, who, will, who will not be able to uh, lie flat, then we do uh, these biopsies under general anesthesia. So these are some examples of fluoroscopy being used uh, for core needle biopsies. CT guided biopsy in case of a difficult access area. Again, as I mentioned, uh, adherence to the principles of biopsy uh, should be kept in mind. So before my uh, interventional radiologist does a CT guided biopsy, 
He always asks me to mark the track which he needs to follow to get the biopsy because you will have to ultimately include this biopsy scar in your definitive incision, okay? Ultrasound guided biopsies, we've discussed that already. So in summary, if you have any doubt and you're not sure what it is, always biopsy, nobody will blame you. If you're in doubt and you don't know, discuss it with somebody who's skilled in musculoskeletal tumors and you will never regret doing a biopsy because the last thing you want to do is to get caught out in a scenario where you were not expecting anything like this to happen. Any questions about bone biopsies? Uh, sir, uh, uh, one point needs uh, further clarification regarding excisional biopsy. Uh -huh. uh, as mentioned, was two centimeter. Uh, yes. Sir, this is uh, this is uh, uh, deep to the uh, deep facial layer. This size is considered, or it is considered for those biopsies which are soft tissue, oh. but facial to the deep layer. The size is the size of the tumor. The size of the tumor is two centimeters or less than the situation. And that is where you do an excision biopsy. Sir, one question. Sir, as in book written that uh, incision biopsy is the gold standard. Oh, I'm asking which one you will do and what should be your answer. Look, I have told you too that practice and books are completely different. Most of the books yes. that you read were written about 15 or 20 years ago or 10-15 years ago. And those are written by yes, generalists. Now, depend your option of doing a two-cut biopsy by saying that the two-cut biopsy can be done in the clinic. There is minimal soft tissue violation. There is only a stab incision. You do not need to take the patient to theater and you get the whole tone of the lesion. So normal to abnormal tumor which is what the pathologist means. So the book mentioned things which are prehistoric in our world. Uh, so you mention that in your exam, options that are available for doing a biopsy. But in practice, what we do is completely different. Is okay, that sir. sir, one question more. Yes, sir, it's clear. Sir, one question more. Uh, if we are taking a uh, two-cut biopsy, it should be from one side of the lesion or from different side, two, three side no, of so the lesion. The track is the same one. You never change the track. Okay. Okay, sir. The same compartment, you do not change the compartment. But when you put your needle in, you can divert your needle into <laughs> with which you can put samples from different areas. There is a technique called a coaxial technique where you can leave your stilet within the wound and with that you can divert your needle in different directions. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. sir, one question more. Uh, yes. Can I just say something? Yeah? That is not, just not from biopsy. Sorry, uh, it's from GCT. sir. It's from GCT. Uh, in stage two, what's the role of denosumab? We so, can uh, give denosumab in stage two. We have got a separate talk about GCT, so we'll discuss that in that section. Okay, sir. We will see. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So for, for everybody, you must understand that most books take 10 years to write and another 10 years before you get in Pakistan. 
You must always read when you finish your exams evidence based medicine. What you are hearing today, is not the exam is not the exam is what the national standard treatment on the world is. So just, just understand that folks, especially in Kashmir, can I ask some of the participants? There's a lot of background noise. If you can try and minimize, yeah, I'm going to stop them. Yeah, no worries. All of them. I think I've stopped most of them. Dishan, what has happened is not only you've got a, a big audience, but each telephone and place have about two or three people also listening at the same time. And some of them are on call. So they are they are they are having a, a lot of background noise. But I'm trying to mute everybody and hopefully they will give you a quite the audience. But yeah, very good. No, not a problem. So uh is everything clear or hopefully slightly clear about biopsy, right? Um, we can proceed from here. <coughs> Shall we proceed, Munawar Saab? Yes, yes. The screen is all yes, clear. Sir, everything yes, sir. is clear up there. I'm trying my, my to... My guests are getting worried. They're thinking, why is he coming in and out? I've just told them I'm doing lectures in Pakistan and they can't understand the concept that you're sitting home and how can you lecture in Pakistan? Like, isn't it? <laughs> But this is a great forum, isn't it? What do you think, Zishan? Yes, yes, it's brilliant. It's much better than the uh, the WhatsApp that we used to do. Yeah, uh, not just a pretty face, then, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right? Can you see? Can you see the talk now, guys? Yes. Yes, yes I can see. Okay. So uh, this is the exciting bit. So we've done some of the boring bit. This is the exciting bit where I get a chance to show you what. Uh, amazing operations we can do for these patients. Um, and this is where we're going to talk about uh, some chemotherapeutic agents that you guys uh, mentioned. So I would probably suggest that you either uh, write down some of these regimes or take pictures. Uh, in any case, uh, Mr. Shah is recording this so you guys can have access to it later on. So when we talk of bone tumors, there are a lot of anxieties and fears. Um, a lot of people who come and talk to me about orthopedic oncology, they'll tell me, oh, sir, bohat sare marid gharib hote hain, inke paas paise nahi hote. And it's true, it's, it's not as lucrative as others. The infrastructure um, isn't as good uh, in Pakistan as it is in the Western world, but it is getting better. Things are getting better. Uh, so there are lots of things, uh, as we call them as the white elephant in the room, uh, that incorporates orthopedic oncology. This was uh, a, a picture taken from the SEER data. This was probably the biggest uh, study that was done on the epidemiology of uh, bone tumors. And as you can see, 3% of all tumors that presented in the United States were bony in origin. Sorry, just to clear my throat. Now, historically, uh, these patients were left to die. Um, uh, Mr. Shah might remember uh, uh, that in certain books, the standard treatment for these patients when they were diagnosed with osteosarcoma was that they were left alone for six to eight months because all of them believed that these patients will die. And at six months, if they didn't die, they would take off their leg or arm. And what they noticed was that they were still dying. So prior to uh, 1970s, the outcomes were quite poor. Uh, and the only surgery that was available for these patients was amputation. So then the magic word that transformed the care of these patients uh, was chemotherapy. And these are the common chemotherapeutic agents that are used uh, in the management of these primary bone tumors. I've already mentioned to you that there is no role of chemotherapy or radiotherapy in chondrosarcoma. And the commonest two primary bone tumors are osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. Now remember in Pakistan, the commonest two chemotherapeutic agents that patients get for osteosarcoma are cisplatin and doxorubicin. Whereas in the rest of the world, all these patients for osteosarcoma will also get 
high dose intra arterial methotrexate in pakistan it's only shaukat khanam hospital and agha khan who are doing this and i'm trying to convince my local oncologists to start this as well um even in india in tata memorial hospital they are not using it once i discussed it with my colleagues there and the other chemotherapeutic agents that are used uh in um giving sarcoma are ifosfamide and etoposide so the the regime that is used for osteosarcoma is called the map protocol map so just remember that and for ewing sarcoma it's the wide v i d i e wide i e protocol and these are the common therapeutic agents that are used in them so as you can see in this survivorship curve the risk the the, the rate of survivorship Uh, increase significantly in patients who received chemotherapy in comparison to those who didn't have one can you repeat it uh, so what was that uh, can you repeat the regime right so for osteosarcoma the regime that is used is called map map and in that one the commonest ones are doxorubicin and cisplatin ideally it should have high dose intra arterial methotrexate but this is not commonly used in all centers across pakistan the one for ewing sarcoma is called wide protocol and in that one along with these we also use ifosfamide and etoposide you've got some of these uh, i'll show you some of these slides in in the other talks as well now why sh- why do we operate then uh, if chemotherapy is really good one because we enjoy it because it's fun and we like operating but in all fairness chemotherapy gives you systemic control but we do surgery for local control of tumor because you need to resect that tumor and then reconstruct that okay now the most important thing for us is the plain film and this is what you'll commonly see in your exams you'd probably be put up you probably have a plain radiograph put up and this is where your viva will start so the only thing i can suggest to you from this talk if you can is to be very very verbal in describing your x-rays and there are seven questions which you should ask yourselves or answer when you're describing an x-ray uh, along with the usual uh, demographic so which bone where in the bone and what is the lesion doing to the bone what is the bone doing to the lesion in response is there a periosteal reaction is there a soft tissue mass and is there a characteristic matrix now if you have a look at this one you can see that there is a lesion which is probably benign looking there is no periosteal reaction the lesion is in the fibula it is in the meta epiphysis it has got a narrow zone of transition and you can see some cartilaginous chondroid matrix and this lesion was actually a chondromyxoid fibroma which is a benign lesion sorry i'm just trying to move all of this from here because i can't see most of my slides okay so the plain air radiograph is the most important thing and this these are the seven questions that you need to remember and mention to your examiner in the questions bec- in in the exam because this is where you'll get most of the marks so what are the common primary malignant bone tumors osteosarcoma ewing sarcoma and chondrosarcoma now remember in osteosarcoma there is a bimodal age distribution so it is common in patients from 10 to 20 years of age and then there's another peak in patients above the age of 60 where some of them will have secondary osteosarcomas mostly in patients who have had radiotherapy 
So patients who get radiotherapy, they are at risk of developing a secondary osteosarcoma, usually at 10 years after radiotherapy. So osteosarcoma, bimodal age distribution. Ewing sarcoma is common in patients younger than 10 years of age or patients above the age of 20. And Ewing sarcomas have a predilection for flat bones like scapula uh, in the pelvis, but they can present themselves in long bones as well. Another difference to remember is that the osteosarcomas will usually involve the metaepiphyseal region. So I repeat, osteosarcomas usually involve the metaepiphyseal region, whereas in Ewing sarcoma, it is the metadiaphysis. It is the metadiaphysis. Now, I'm saying usually, not always. There are always cases which will transgress these principles. Chondrosarcoma, uh, there can be primary or secondary. They can present themselves anywhere. Chondrosarcomas are usually uh, in, present in patients above the age of 50, but patients who have osteochondromas they can then transform into chondrosarcomas. And those are the ones which are called as secondary chondrosarcomas. So this is, this is the uh, burden of tumors. And as you can see that the commonest tumor that presents is metastases. Uh, but the commonest primary bone tumor is an osteosarcoma followed by chondro and Ewing sarcoma. Any king staging of these tumors, I'm sure all of you know about this and have read this, so we don't need to talk about this. If you want to take a picture of it, this is the any king staging system of musculoskeletal tumors. This is the AJCC system. Uh, now, some people use this. Uh, you can find this uh, in some of the international literature. However, uh, one of the drawbacks is that they mention lymph nodes in this as well. And as a matter of principle, well, not always, but in most of the cases, sarcomas do not involve lymph nodes. As you all know, it is the carcinomas that involve lymph nodes, not sarcomas. But in certain sarcomas, particularly the soft tissue ones like synovial sarcomas, they do involve lymph nodes. Location is variable in all these cases. Uh, predominantly, it's around the knee hip and the pelvis and the humerus. I've already mentioned to you about osteogenic sarcoma. Another uh, common reason for secondary osteosarcoma is conversion of Paget's disease into osteosarcoma. And they are always high grade and there are different variants of it and there are different names and they are uh, histological subtypes. There are some different variants, which are parosteal and periosteal, and they in turn can be high grade. So, as I mentioned already, their commonest location is metaepiphyseal. Uh, plain radiographs, you all know about the commonest findings, and they can present as pain, lump, restriction of movements, or pathological fracture. Commonest locations, distal femur, proximal tibia, and proximal humerus. However, we, can, we have seen them in every single bone. Now, workup. This is really important and just recapping what we've discussed already. Local staging, systemic staging, and once you've done all of this, we then keep doing a biopsy. Once you've confirmed the diagnosis, then this patient is discussed in the tumor board or MDT, and this patient will have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Important to remember that these patients will have two to three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So I repeat, two to three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by restaging. And that will be local and systemic staging. And then depending on the response, we either proceed to surgery if there is a good response or if the tumor has progressed, then you discuss this in the MDT and you decide on either going for amputation and going chemotherapy, or you give them second line chemotherapy first and then you restage them and decide. 
and after you've done surgery you assess and evaluate the histological response of that tumor to chemotherapy the post chemo necrosis based on hewers criteria and it is based on that after discussion in mdt that you decide on adjuvant chemotherapy so this is the most important slide that you guys need to remember for the journey of a patient with osteosarcoma so i would suggest that you write the write this down or take a picture of it and remember this so this is a patient with a proximal humerus tumor who presented with pain and lump and on the plain radiograph on the x-ray on the left side you can see a periosteal reaction you can see a large soft tissue component a heterogeneous lesion lesion in the metaepiphyseal region there is some cortical break and all of these features are worrying and when you look at the picture on the right side you actually see a large soft tissue component suggestive of a worrying lesion these these here are the neurovascular structures which you can see are free of the tumor so let's go on to ewing sarcoma now in the older uh, literature and in some uh, books even now the term neuroectodermal tumor or the primitive neuroectodermal tumor is uh, used for ewing sarcoma so if you ever come across uh, this an uh, abbreviation of pnet it basically means ewing sarcoma so as i've mentioned that this patient this these present in patients younger than 20 years of age but usually less than 10 10 years of age and as you can see on this x-ray the location is usually metadiaphyseal and histologically they have round blue cells the only other tumor which has round blue cells histologically is lymphoma and how you differentiate between those two is by using a cd99 marker on immunohistochemistry so we've discussed that they are metadiaphyseal usually but they can be metaepiphyseal or purely diaphyseal onion skin appearance you've all read about this in your books in these patients serum lactate dehydrogenase or serum ldh level is elevated this has a prognostic uh, fact uh, this has a prog prognostic role in these patients um and if the level is initially very high and you give them chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting and the serum ldh level comes down then that's a good prognostic sign however if you have a patient if the ldh level continues to be elevated or increases despite this patient being on chemotherapy then that's a bad prognostic sign now the workup is exactly the same it isn't different from osteosarcoma now this is another important slide that you guys need to remember uh, so the regime that we use for osteosarcoma is the map and it includes cisplatin cisplatin doxorubicin and methotrexate two to three cycles in the new adjuvant setting followed by depending on the response to chemotherapy determined on surgical uh, specimens you may or may not need adjuvant chemotherapy usually it's about 6 cycles in total and the regime for ewing sarcoma is the wide protocol and in that you use vincristine ifosfamide doxorubicin and etoposide and again 2 to 4 cycles in this followed by reevaluation restaging surgery and then adjuvant chemotherapy okay so now moving on to chondrosarcoma i've mentioned to you already about primary and secondary chondrosarcomas secondary arise from pre-existing osteochondromas or enchondromas this if you follow my cursor is a primary chondrosarcoma you can see speckled calcification within the medullary canal in a skeletally mature patient this is a patient in the x-ray of the hand where you see multiple enchondromas you all know that multiple enchondromas is called olier's disease and if olier's disease is associated with multiple hemangiomas then it's called mafuchi syndrome which has got 100% uh, 
uh, risk of malignancy. So some of the things to remember. Now, some patients may present with isolated osteochondromas or multiple, in which case they are called hereditary multiple exostosis or multiple osteochondromas, and some people also call it as diaphyseal achalasia, so multiple names for them. Important thing to remember in these cases is the thickness of the cartilage cap which lies on top of this bone. And if this cartilage cap thickness is more than two centimeters, then you need to investigate this and make sure that this is not transformed into a chondrosarcoma. So if you have a pre-existing osteochondroma and it has started enlarging in size or it's becoming painful, get an MRI scan, assess the cartilage cap thickness. If it is more than two centimeters, get a biopsy because there might be malignant transformation. And in that case, deal with it as a chondrosarcoma. Now, one thing you should remember is that you can leave all the other osteochondromas well alone unless they are causing mechanical symptoms to these patients. But the ones around the pelvic girdle or the shoulder girdle should always be excised because they can in progressively increase in size without being noticed and they can transform into chondrosarcoma. So they, this is where I would break the principle, always excise an osteochondroma if it is around the pelvis. So there are three different grades of chondrosarcoma, one, two, and three. One is the lowest grade, three is the de-differentiated or uh, the most aggressive one. And the prognosis in these cases is quite poor. So what is the aim of surgery in malignant bone tumors? Complete excision of tumor. And once you've excised the tumor, you need to reconstruct that defect. And in, whilst you're doing this, you should cause minimal morbidity to that patient. You should restore the function as much as possible. There should be minimum complications and this should be acceptable to the patient and family. So these are the aims of surgery. Now, what are the types of surgery that you can do uh, for these patients? So do not discount amputation uh, as a good option for surgery. An amputation uh, is a one-off procedure uh, where you take the limb off and you can give your patients a good prosthesis on which they can ambulate on. But obviously in this day and age, we do not prefer this as an option. We would like to preserve the limb of the patient. Now, we can use patient's own bone in the form of autograft or recycled bone, as I've discussed with you. We can use endoprosthesis. You can resect the bone and use destruction osteogenesis. You can do resection arthrodesis. And in the lower limb, you can do rotation plasty. So these are the options that you can use. For exam, I like to... Uh, classify things because it makes the examiner think and believe that you've re been reading things very well. So if somebody asks you the options of surgery in malignant bone tumors, I would suggest you break it into this format where it's biological and non-biological. And I've shown you this before and I make no apologies for repetition because repetition is the key to success. So what are the advantages of endoprosthetic replacement? They're readily available. They can be custom made or modular. So they come in different parts and you can make up the size of the implant as you need. It allows immediate weight bearing in cases of lower limb cases. Patients have very rapid function. They have predictable outcome and early complications are low and you do not have to wait for uh, chemotherapy to start after this. What are the disadvantages? Uh, they are expensive. That's the biggest hurdle in our country. With the passage of time, some of them will loosen and some of them will break. There is data up to 20 to 25 years uh, survivorship based on the modern endoprosthetic replacements that are available now. They can fracture. There's a risk of infection. There's a cumulative risk of infection of 1% with every passing year with these. Inceptive 
pattern, like with every other prosthesis, uh, is common in them. And with every uh, every passing year, uh, with, sorry, with every time, uh, particularly in kids, if you put in a growing implant, if it is an invasive growing implant, the risk of infection increases, which increases the risk of amputation. So what can we replace uh, in the muscular skeletal system with endoprosthesis after a section of tumor? Pretty much everything, uh, implants are available throughout the upper and lower limb. So why do we prefer and talk about biological solutions? Um, they are good, particularly in kids, in areas where are, they are difficult to reconstruct, particularly around the humerus, as you will see. Distal radius, mid shaft of the tibia, rather than using an intercalary prosthesis, you can transfer the fibula off the same side and around the pelvis. So have a look here. This is a young patient who had a Ewing sarcoma of the diaphysis, which was resected. The fibula of the same side was transferred and an external fixator was applied. And you can see that the fibula is slowly and gradually hypertrophying to the point that the fibula has now become a tibia. This is a case where a vascularized fibula is used to reconstruct the proximal humerus. Allografts, we don't have them available in Pakistan, but there are options, usually very good around the joint surface or in periarticular tumors. But there are issues with allografts. The biggest problem in our country is availability. You have to match the size. They can fracture, they can go into non-union. You have to immobilize them for a very long time because you want the native host bone to incorporate into this bone, dead bone risk of infection and disease transmission. This is an allograft prosthetic composite that I discussed with you earlier. So this is a spindle cell sarcoma of the proximal femur, which was resected. An allograft was taken, and through that, a proximal femur or a, a diaphyseal fitting implant was cemented and cemented through the native bone. The advantage of using an allograft prosthetic composite is that you can reattach soft tissues and you save some bone. Endoprosthetic reconstruction. This is one of my patients who had a telangiectatic osteosarcoma of the distal femur. You can see the length of incision, the scar incorporating the biopsy scar, resected specimen, with the trial prosthesis where we are checking the size, actual implant being incorporated, assembled, and put in. And as you can see, the range of movement in this station. Start this. And this is on table. This is the beauty of endoprosthesis, and this patient walks straight after. So another patient who had uh, a metastatic disease of the proximal femur, good survivorship, uh, where we took off the uh, proximal femur and reconstructed it with a bipolar endoprosthesis. This was one of my patients where you can see that there's popcorn appearance, a very large chondrosarcoma of the proximal femur. And in this axial scan, you can see that the neurovascular bundle is free. So this is very important for me. And actually, I remember that this patient, some surgeon inadvertently or naively had put in a DHS through it. So this is the resected specimen, which we resected and I'd put in a proximal femur replacement with a cemented surf cup. This is another example of a patient who had a very large uh, pelvic chondrosarcoma, as you can see, it involves the sacroiliac joint and crosses into the sacrum, but just free of the sacral foramen. So we were able to save the uh, sacral nerve roots. So this is us whilst taking the tumor out. Now, if you look at this picture here, my, where my cursor is, this is the sciatic nerve, which has been saved. These bars go into the L3-4 vertebra 
and here they just go into the supraacetabular region as you can see on the x-ray here so we excised it but because we've taken the sacroiliac joint out along with part of the sacrum i had asked my uh, spinal surgical colleague to help out with the lumbo pelvic fixation and this was the patient this is a very old video this was the patient walking at three months following surgery. So what are the other options? This was a patient who had a resection of the distal radius for a GCT twice before he came to me. And he had the fibula autographed used from both sides. And you can see the soft tissue lump on here. I gave this patient denosumab, which has calcified the soft tissue component. And then I resected this and did an ulna centralization or a single bone forearm with an abdominal flap to give them soft tissue coverage. And this is the patient. This is the patient at six months following surgery having very good First range of motion, yes, no rotation at the elbow. Now what I do sometimes, which you probably should not mention in your exams, but just to give you an idea of how we can improvise, is by using a nail cement spacer around the proximal humerus. So this was a large uh, osteosarcoma, which we excise around the proximal humerus. And I get a cheap K nail and on top of this, I put in a cement, uh, a cement blob, which is exactly similar to the size of the humeral head, which I measure from the other side. And I will then cement this humeral nail into the humerus shaft. But because most of the times all the rotator cuff is gone and quite a lot of the deltoid, I, along with this, I use a proline mesh to anchor this around the glenoid. And they heal on very nicely. Uh, and they do reasonably well. So this was to show you some of the options that we have available to us in uh, reconstructing uh, these tumors. But is that the end of the road? No, we still get patients who are wrongly treated because we as orthopedic surgeons cannot inhibit this oculogyric reflex. Whenever we see a fracture, we try to fix it and do something which will jeopardize limb salvage surgery. Here are some examples of improperly based biopsies. So what is the solution? To educate ourselves to have sarcoma treatment centers and have lots of meetings and be the bigger person in the picture and refer them to people who know what to do with them. And just to reiterate, an orthopedic oncologist is a member of a multidisciplinary team. You're not an individual. Any questions? So, so before we ask yes. question, I just want to make a comment on it that in the exam it is perfectly safe to say that this is a complex problem. I will ask my local oncology orthopedic surgeon to come and have a look at it or chat with him. However, unfortunately, some of the examiners in Pakistan would then say, you are the specialist, deal with it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but it is quite fair to say in the exam that, you know, I will ask one of my colleagues who has got more experience to help me out in this particular part. Okay, question. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, Sir, can you uh, tell a little about follow-up of these patients? How we follow these patients in clinic and uh, regarding investigations in the follow-up? Okay, fine. That's a very valid question. Uh, so the immediate post-op follow-up is exactly the same for any other condition. We see them at two weeks and hopefully at that time you have the histology report, which you then discuss in the MDT. Now, Barring all of this, the standard follow-up for these patients is every three months for the first two years. And you do a chest x-ray on every follow-up visit, along with the x-ray of the extremity which has been operated on. Okay, so for the first two years, it's every three months and at every follow-up, you get a chest x-ray and x-ray of the extremity that's been operated on. 
And if you have any doubts on the chest X-ray, you then get a CT of the chest. Or if you have any doubt on the X-ray of the extremity, you get an MRI of the extremity. From year three up until year five, it's every six months with the similar protocol that I've just mentioned. And from year six on to year 10, it's every year with the similar X-rays. Now at 10 years, these patients are safe and you can discharge them. However, I would like to keep those patients in follow-up in whom I've put an endoprosthesis and I would like to see them every year. Is that clear to you now? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Excellent, sir. Excellent. Any other questions? Sir, uh, regarding the internal hemipilvectomy, as uh, you have shown one case that the sacrum uh, was excised, sir. Uh, would you like to, sir, make it easy for us for the exam purpose that uh, uh, which type of internal hemipilvectomy need reconstruction and which type do not? Uh, I, I've got a talk on reconstruction options in which hemipelvectomies are there. And this is the next one after this. Uh, so we will discuss all of those there, if you allow me to. Yeah, let's go on and do as much as possible. I'm only worried about your time. We all have all the time in the world, right? It's just how much you have to do and, and, and what you can do or you can... Well, well I'm, 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 I'm up for it. Uh, my family okay, well, you're is... Afraid. We're all afraid. Uh, let me just find out. So just give me a moment whilst I identify the next talk. I've just planned... Sir, GCT kalne pehle? It is, uh, it is an examiner examiner favorite uh, topic. No, no. We, we, we will it is much be in exam. But I have I have planned all my talks in in such a fashion that it will cover everything. So I don't want to break the routine. Just 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 bear with me, and I promise you we'll cover everything. Yeah, and if you have to go somewhere, then uh, um, it will be on a video, and you can get a copy of it up from from the forum. Then yeah, so don't worry. So can you see this slide now? Yes. yes, sir, we can see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so reconstructive options following sarcoma resection, right? Okay, so oculogyric reflex. This is what I want you guys to refrain from. There is a fracture and I need to fix it. Mr. Shah will be aware of this notion. There was a video circulated by lots of uh, medical professionals, anesthetic colleagues just pretending or making us appear as completely thick. And actually, uh, a lot of us uh, will do things inadvertently, which we should not. So do not fix every fracture, okay? Now, preparation is the key to success. Aims of surgery, we've already discussed. And as I've mentioned, there will be some repetition. And repetition is something which will make you remember these things. Now, what are the challenges in reconstruction? Because after we've resected tumor, there will be large gaps that will be left. Uh, and you need to fill these gaps. But when you are doing limb salvage surgery, it is important to remember that there should be no compromise on attaining clear, acceptable, free margins. And whichever reconstruction you do, it should be stable, it should be mobile, it should be durable and acceptable to the patient and the family. Contraindications to limb salvage surgery, we've already discussed this. And as I mentioned, that these are barriers. They are not absolute contraindications. And with advances in imaging, advances in technology, and whilst we're getting better at our surgical technique, very rarely do we am perform amputation. So we've discussed about surgical options already in a previous slide, and I've mentioned to you about the biological and non-biological options. Endoprosthetic reconstructions, I prefer to use them, uh, particularly around the lower limb because uh, they allow early return to function if patient's affordability is not a problem. Uh, we've already discussed that we can replace almost every joint 
and we've discussed the disadvantages with them. But endoprosthetic reconstructions have problems with pediatric patients. Why? Because they have small medullary canals, they have growing bones, there will be leg length discrepancy, which leads to high rate of revision surgery and increased functional demands of these patients, which is why we resort to biological solutions when we can in pediatric patients, particularly around the upper limb and in certain cases, as I'll show you in some of the cases around the lower limb. So biological reconstruction, it's inexpensive if you're using autografts or if you're using recycled bone. The problem with it is that there is a long duration of non-weight bearing if you use it in the lower limb. There is a risk of infection. There's a risk of fracture. Allograft, the problem with it is that they are not available particularly in Pakistan. I've already shown you this case where the fibula hypertrophied at five years, almost the size of the tibia. Recycled bone, uh, again, is something quite common, which is used in the developed countries. Uh, you can put that tumor bone, which you have resected with clear margins, into an autoclave. You can pasteurize it. You can put it in a microwave. You can give it radiotherapy or you can expose it to liquid nitrogen. I'll just give you a quick overview of what that means. So in essence, what you do is you take the tumor out along with the planned margins and you expose it to any of these methods. You take away all the soft tissue from it. You curate all the tumor from it. You reposition that piece of bone back into where you've excised it from. And you can either put cement through that bone because this is dead bone or the best scenario is that you put in live bone through this dead bone. Uh, so ideally a vascularized fibula. I'll show you some pictures of it and it will then make sense. Now for autoclave, you put the bone in autoclave for 8 to 10 minutes at 130 degrees Celsius. And a lot of studies have shown that at this temperature and during this time, all the tumor cells are killed. Whereas with pasteurization, if you put this bone at 62 degrees Celsius for 45 minutes, for 45 minutes in heated water, this will kill all the tumor cells. You can put this in a microwave for eight to 10 minutes. You can put send this bone for radiation where you expose it to 50 to 60 grays for about 25 minutes or you can take this bone and put it in liquid nitrogen which will kill all the tumor cells so let's talk of specific areas proximal femur i've already shown you this case which was reconstructed with an endoprosthesis Another patient shown you already, endoprosthesis. This was a case which was, uh, or a paper published in the JBJS, the British one long time ago, where the proximal uh, fibula along with its epiphysis was used to plumb into the uh, hip joint to reconstruct the proximal femur which was resected. And what they found in serial x-rays was this fibula hypertrophied and that neck and head of the fibula transformed into a femur head. So this was another patient uh, who had a proximal femur tumor, a diaphyseal one where the tumor was resected and a fibula was put in. Allograft prosthetic composite, as we've discussed, can be used in distal femurs, resection, and reconstruction with endoprosthesis. Now, the endoprosthesis can be joint sparing endoprosthesis as well, where you can preserve the joint. Now, in pediatric patients, as I've mentioned, that because they have growing bones, 
you might need to put in extendable prosthesis where you go in, make an incision, and you turn some screws in it, and the length of the prosthesis increases. Uh, but with the passage of time, technology has changed. Now we have non non-invasive growing implants where there is an electric motor that is put in these prostheses and these kids will come in and put their legs in this electric motor and that will uncoil the coupling and increase the length of it as desired. Allograft prosthetic composite again can also be used around the knee. This is one of my patients um, who is a six years old boy from Waziristan in whom we resected the distal femur uh, and used the growth plate as a clear margin as you can see on this x-ray on the left and put in a vascularized fibula. And at three months, you can see that the fibula is already hypertrophied and this patient is fully weight bearing and has got good range of movements around the knee. Resection arthrodesis is also an option. This was a patient in whom we used a uh, 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 recycled bone. So on the clinical photograph on the left side, you can see that this patient had an open biopsy and he had involvement of almost the whole tibia and he could not afford a whole tibia prosthesis. So what we decided on was a hybrid type of fixation. So the leg on the left side is the one where the tumor was involved. And from the right side, my plastic surgeon will harvest a vascularized fibula. So I took out the whole of the tibia along with the biopsy scar, as you can see on the photograph on the right side. Then we sent it for autoclave and this is how it comes back. On the picture on the left side, when uh, I took off all the soft tissue, I found that the quality of bone was quite poor. So I resected that. The pic clinical picture on the right side, I'm reaming the medullary canal, clearing off all of it. Then I'm I fused the distal end of the tibia with the ankle. So in essence, I've performed an ankle fusion. As you can see on this picture here, I've created a window through which I will put in uh, the vascularized fibula, which we have harvested from the other side, as you can see on here. So this is the fibula that has been fed through the tibia and that is arthrodesed into the knee. And the fibula of the same side is already vascularized and has been arthrodesed into the knee as well. And these are the post-op x-rays. So this is a picture of recycled bone reconstruction. Now you can argue that I might have put in sturdy uh, plates to reconstruct this, but actually with these screws, I got good, console, good uh, grip, and this patient was going to be in plaster for a long time anyway, so I just put some screws in. Sometimes limb salvage is not possible. Uh, rotation plasty is something which we need to discuss. Uh, this was popularized by Van Ness in 1950s and they were mostly performed for proximal femoral focal deficiencies at the time. And in essence, what it is, is that you're converting a an above knee amputation into a below knee amputation and you're getting your ankle joint to work as a knee. And as we know from our biomechanical studies, that a patient with below knee amputation will have less energy expenditure in comparison to an above knee amputation. So this is what it involves. If you have a look at the picture on the left side, this whole block, which involves the tumor along with the joint has been removed. The leg has been taken up, rotated through 180 degrees so that the foot is looking at the back and then they are joined together. I've not done any of these in Pakistan. I've assisted a few during my fellowship in England. This is one of those cases. And this is a patient who has a good prosthesis in and they can do very good uh, functional activities. They're done quite frequently in India. 
Um, the other problem with these is to find a good prosthetist who can um, make good prosthesis for you. Uh, there is also some concern about development of ankle joint arthritis at 10 to 12 years following this. So proximal tibia, uh, the best bet is to do a proximal tibia replacement. Whenever we do a proximal tibia endoprosthetic replacement, we complement it with a gastronemius flap. And the reason why we do this is because the proximal tibia is quite subcutaneous. So when you provide this with a flap, it reduces the risk of infection by 30%. And the other bit is that you use this flap to reconstruct the extensor mechanism because you attach the patellar tendon to this. This is an endoprosthetic reconstruction of a proximal tibia where a joint sparing endoprosthesis was used. Uh, these are photographs of a patient who was skeletally immature, had a proximal tibia tumor, had a vascularized fibula put in with a blade plate, which was hypertrophying quite nicely. And at some point of time, it fractured where elastic nails was put through. But surprisingly, look at the size of the uh, fibula, which has now tibialized, if you may call it. Uh, Intercalary resection. Uh, is another uh, um, option. So if you have a tumor uh, which is involves the diaphysis, you can resect that and you can shift the uh, ipsilateral fibula into it or you can put in a vascularized fibula from the contralateral side. Tumors around the foot and ankle are quite difficult to treat. Um, uh, endoprosthetic reconstruction can be performed. Um, I wrote a paper on endoprosthesis of tibia, but they don't do really well. In all fairness, most of foot and ankle tumors uh, patients end up having amputation. But this clinical photograph gives you an idea of how to deal uh, with a distal tibia tumor in which you can uh, transfer the uh, fibula of the same side or can augment it with a fibula from the other side as well. Amputation should not be discounted. As I mentioned, uh, there are very good companies available now who provide very good uh, prosthesis with patients having very good function. This was a patient who had a pathological fracture and this is a case from UK, uh, which we saw during my fellowship training and um, in a district general hospital, they put elastic nails through it. And actually, this was an osteosarcoma, very large incision that you can see. But still, we were able to save the leg by taking the whole femur out and doing a total femur replacement. So let's go to the upper limb. Uh, now, this is a patient who had uh, a, an osteosarcoma of the, uh, sorry, this was a Ewing sarcoma of the scapula, which also involved the shoulder joint. So in this patient, I performed a Tikoff Lindbergh type reconstruction, which means taking out the whole of the scapula along with the shoulder joint and part of the humerus, and then suspending that humerus from the clavicle, as you can see with those two holes with Merceline tape. And you'll be surprised that these patients have very good function, uh, almost normal function at the elbow and have some function at the shoulder joint. So this is one option. Around the proximal humerus, this was one of our patients in whom we did a vascularized fibula and the fibula was fused into the scapula. So they get a fibuloglenoid arthrodesis and you can see the fibula has healed nicely into it. The other option uh, is to do an endoprosthetic reconstruction. They are expensive, they are easy. The problem with this is that if you do not have any rotator cuff left or deltoid left, you don't have any function. Whereas with the previous case that I've switched back to, this is where you're relying on your scapulothoracic movements and these patients get about 80 to 90 degrees of abduction and some forward flexion. And this is my preferred choice for reconstruction in young patients. What are the options around the elbow? 
well, one thing to remember is that tumors around the elbow are rare, but the main option is an arthrodesis, but one can also do an elbow replacement. Around the distal radius, you can resect and you can put in an autograft from the fibula with which you can do an arthrodesis or an arthroplasty. You can use an iliac crest. You can use the anterior part of the tibial crest or you can do a single bone forearm as I have done on here where you can centralize the elbow, uh, the, uh, the ulna or you can do an ulna translocation where you resect this part of the ulna and shift it onto the radius and then fuse the elbow. The advantage of ulnar translocation is that these patients will have some preservation of rotation. This is now my preferred technique for distal radius tumors because I do not have to worry about harvesting uh, the uh, fibula. Um, there is, however, some concern about the thinness of the forearm and the risk of fractures. In my practice in Pakistan, since I've returned over the last three years, I probably have done about a dozen of these, and none of the patients have uh, shown any concerns about the cosmetic appearances and touch wood. None of them have fractured so far. You can also put in endoprosthesis. Uh, these are some of the pictures from patients we did in the UK. They can be in the form of arthroplasty or arthrodesis. I wouldn't prefer or suggest doing them. We've discussed about the option of arthrodesis or arthroplasty around the shoulder, uh, around the wrist. There are advantages and disadvantages of both. The main concern is instability if you do arthroplasty. So here we have uh, pelvic tumors. So somebody mentioned or asked about pelvic tumors. Uh, there are four different types of pelvic resections, uh, and they are uh, by Enneking. This was the classification by Enneking. So if you resect only the iliac bone, then this is called type 1 resection. Any resection around the acetabulum or involving the acetabulum is type 2. Any resection around the ischial tuberosity or the pubis is type 3 and any resection involving the sacrum is type 4. So some of your resections might purely be of one type, but they may involve the others. So like the lumbopelvic fixation that I showed you was a combination of a type 1 and type 4 excision. <clears throat> now coming to the question that was asked by one of the colleagues about type 1 resection. Now, you don't always have to reconstruct the pelvic ring. However, there was a paper that was published just recently that showed that there was some functional benefit if you reconstructed the ring after doing a P1 type resection. And you can do that by putting in a non-vascularized or a vascularized fibula from the supraacetabular region into the sacrum. This is uh, a post-op picture of one of my patients. This is the commonest approach that is used uh, for pelvic tumors, which is called as the Ollier's approach. And this starts from the posterior superior iliac spine or just around the natal cleft, curves around the iliac crest, goes right onto the uh, symphysis pubis, and another limb uh, intersecting from the middle, curving over the greater trochanter, coming down over the shaft of the femur. So this is the all years utilitarian approach that we use for pelvic tumors. These are modifications of the all years approach that you can use. So this was a patient of mine who had a chondrosarcoma of the acetabulum. As you can see, there was a large soft tissue component, but it was free of the rectum and the bladder. And this, in this patient, I performed an extra articular resection because the joint was involved. So I did a type 2 resection, which was extra articular, and I left this patient with a hanging hip. And as you can see on this extra on the, on the right side, that there was pseudoarthrosis. And on last follow-up, this patient is mobilizing with the aid of a walking stick. 
Now, this is a picture of a patient who had reconstruction of the pelvic ring with a fibula. As you can see, that there was very minimal acetabulum left. So I put in circlage wires around this fibula here and two screws into the sacrum. This gadget that you see on here is the phone. Don't, don't confuse this with any fancy type of fixation that I've done. So when I can, in younger patients, I prefer to reconstruct the pelvic ring. Let's talk about the pediatric patients. They are unique, we all know, because they've got growing bones, they've got open physis. Chemotherapy may affect their bone growth and their activity level is quite high, which is why they've got higher demands and they've got a long life ahead of them. Pediatric tumors constitute about 13% of all the tumor load in pediatric patients. The principles are the same, uh, regardless of the age. Uh, and we prefer biological reconstruction in these patients. So to put in an autograft or allograft or recycled bone. So these are clinical photographs from a colleague from Tata Memorial Hospital, where you can see that the distal femur had a Ewing sarcoma, which was re resected along with the biopsy scar, as you can see on here. All the soft tissue is taken away from it and then it is sent away in these sterile containers for radiotherapy. And then when they come back, they are cleansed with a vancomycin solution for about 20 minutes, and it is plumbed in with bone cement through it. However, you can put in a vascularized fibula through that as well. So I think I've bored you enough with these reconstruction talks for the time being. So we'll end here with this. If you have any questions and you're still awake, I'm happy to answer them. Sir, one question. Uh, in a wide margin dissection, um, most of the tumor we say we take the wide margin two centimeter on all the uh, on all the planes and superior, inferiorly, medial, laterally. So where does it, this two centimeter comes? It should be three, four. How two centimeter it is? Okay, so I think, I think you missed uh, some part of the earlier talks. We did discuss about uh, the concept of uh, histologically or surgically safe margins, okay? So if you have a tumor where you have an intact fascial layer around it, even if it is a millimeter. So let me just give you an example. You have a soft tissue tumor, which is in the rectus femoris, and it is lying on top of the femur, okay? Now, in order for you to get textbook clearance, you will then have to do an amputation. But instead, you take off the tumor along with the periosteum from the bone, and that periosteum constitutes an intact fascial layer. So this is histologically clear margin, okay? So this is important to remember. Now, in longitudinal direction, some books will tell you anywhere from two to five centimeters in soft tissues. Now, this may not hold true in all circumstances because your anatomical constraints might stop you from doing this. So you have to compromise. Radially, we say one centimeter in circumference. Again, this may not be possible in all the cases. So there is a compromise that you make in terms of surgical clearance and the amount of function that you're leaving with the patient. It is also important to remember that any reconstruction that you do should be functional because it is absolutely rubbish doing a limb salvage surgery in a functionless leg or arm. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, sir, thank you. And also remember that the person has to have a minimum of three months life in this country. I'm not sure what it is in, in, in Pakistan, but you have I, to have a minimum of life for, for them to work with. It depends on who they consult. <laughs> that's, that's the principle in Pakistan. <laughs> okay. Do you have that a giant cell talk or do you want to come back again? I don't mind, whatever. I've been recording and everybody can use it afterwards. There's about seven of us here today now. 
We started with 15 with one person having five people on the same screen. But I think that James said is an important talk. And if you can do it, yeah. run through it quickly, then everybody can share it when I put it in the forum then. Yeah, I, I think have the, the patience and the time. The TCP talk should not take more than 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, let's uh, get on with it then. Let's get on with it then. And then, and then call it a day and probably... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. for. I'm, I, you've done more than what you said. You said 45 minutes, but you, you've touched everything. And I think after this, if somebody fails two minutes, then they should all be hung on this. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's do the giant cell and at least it'll be on a hard copy for people to see. <laughs> anyway, Islamabad United made uh, over 236 runs. It's a record for a T20 match. <laughs> Very interesting in cricket. Right. Can you guys uh, see the talk now? Not yet. No. It's not happening. Not yet, sir. <laughs> no, sir. Try again. So you just have to bear with me for. You're doing so well. It, it just doesn't want to uh, uh, move on to the next slide. But you're frozen. Uh, no, it's not frozen. It's just my ignorance, sheer ignorance. Um, You've done well. We've done a PowerPoint presentation. We've done it on 4K okay. video, so it can't be bad. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Can everyone see it now? Yes. Okay. Um, Right. So you're all absolutely right that GCT uh, is a very common topic in the exams. And um, I, I can honestly tell you that if you get a tumor case in your exam, in your vivas or tokes, that if you reproduce about 70 to 80 percent of what we've discussed today, you'll get flying marks. And I remember in our adult path section when I was doing my FRCS ORTH, I was lucky that I had two cancer cases and I did really well, which compensated for the rest of it. So I would suggest that if you get a tumor case, do not be worried. This is probably the one where you'll get most of the marks, but all you need to do is to stick to the basics. Okay. So a giant cell of giant cell tumor of bone is um, a locally aggressive B9 neoplasm, which can rarely metastasize. Now, it is one of the two benign bone tumors which can metastasize, the other one being a chondroblastoma. About 2% of giant cell tumors will metastasize to the lungs, and even if they do so, they still are benign. However, there is a malignant variety of giant cell tumor of bone which is exactly similar to osteosarcoma. So it is important to understand this fact. As I mentioned, they are mostly periarticular. Uh, they are on long bones, but they can present in the uh, axial skeleton as well. Now, the pathology of giant cell tumor of bone is exactly similar to the development of osteoporosis. So it involves the rank ligand overexpression um, and the osteoclastic giant cells, which causes resorption of bone. It is almost as ha half as common as osteosarcoma. The incidence is around 1.5 per million population per year. And they arise in patients generally between the ages of 20 to 40 years. However, variations exist, but the commonest age is 20 to 40 years. And the commonest areas of presentation in terms of frequency are proximal tibia, distal femur, proximal humerus, followed by distal radius. So classical X-ray description, as I mentioned to you earlier, they are lytic lesions, they are expensile, they are periarticular, they are eccentric, and they are aggressive looking lesions. Okay, so this is important to remember. So these are some giant cell tumors presenting in other parts of the bone, proximal tibia, distal radius, proximal humerus. 
distal femur in the spine and in the metacarpal as well. Now, I would suggest that you memorize the Campanacci staging system for your exam. It is a radiological system. It is easy to remember. It has three grades. And usually what we see is the grade three plus in Pakistan at presentation. I'm sure you guys all know this. If you want to take a picture, I'll give you a pause for a few seconds. But this is probably the easiest one to remember, Campanacci staging system. Now, the standard of treatment for this is as complete a removal of this tumor as possible without causing major morbidity. And the aim is to preserve the joint if possible. The standard treatment that we do in here is intralesional curettage. However, sometimes we see so mammoth GCTs that we end up resecting them completely or also doing amputations. I'll tell you what detailed intralesional curettage is as we go through the slides. Now we can use adjuvants in the treatment of GCTs and these adjuvants are in the form of polymethyl methacrylate, the bone cement. You can use phenol, you can use ethanol, you can use cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen. Patient people use argon beam lasers for this as well. And uh, bisphosphonates have been used in the past as well, just because the pathological or the pathogenesis is exactly similar to osteoporosis. So there's a thought whether they will be helpful. So what do I do? Uh, when I get a patient for GCT, and this is what I would recommend, although I'm no authority, but this, was, this is what I would suggest you guys do in your practice and your exams, because this is what I learned from the best in the field. So planning, and this should start after you've done your staging studies. You need to have everything that you need for the surgery. So you need to have a proper inventory. You need to plan for a detailed curettage because we're planning to do joint salvage. You also need to have a pulsed levage gun, a high speed burr. And I'll tell you what I do. So I make a window, a cortical window for this tumor, which is almost of the same size of this lesion. I will start curetting with different size angles and shapes of curettes with Gauze is packed around the bone so that I do not come contaminate the normal soft tissue with this tumor. Once I've done a curettage, I will use a pulsed levage gun to clear the cavity from inside. I will then stain the inside cavity with pyodine because it's brown. And then I will use a high speed burr to clear off all that pyodine so to convert the inside brownish environment into a white environment, followed by pulse levage gun again. And I will repeat this cycle until I have two consecutive cycles free of any lesional tissue. So this is my routine of how to do a detailed intralesional curettage. So this is what you need. High speed burrs after making a big cortical window different curettes of different shapes and sizes and a pulse levage gun. Now the local recurrence rate uh, is quite variable in GCTs and that actually depends on two things. One, the grade of the tumor and two, the extent of the intralesional curettage. And it is reported anywhere from 10 to 50% and the highest being uh, in the grade three tumors. And most of the recurrences with any musculoskeletal tumors is within the first two years. And if you get a local recurrence, it can usually be, usually, so I'm using the word usually, be treated by repeat curettage, but sometimes you may need to check that bone to get complete clearance. So this is an X-ray. If you see on the, uh, on the slide on, on the left, that there is a lytic lesion and you would think that this is a well circumscribed lesion but actually when you do an MRI scan you see an associated soft tissue component so on plain x-ray you would have thought this is a grade 2 but on an MR it is a grade 3 lesion 
sometimes if they are in inoperable areas, um, you struggle and you don't know what to do with them. Uh, and in those circumstances and in, in cases where there was high recurrence, uh, there was a surge for newer therapies and that's where denosumab was tried. Now bear in mind, denosumab is not something which has been invented just for GCTs. We have been using this for metastases as well. Bear in mind that chemotherapy does not work in standard GCTs of bone. However, I have seen this being used in some patients in Pakistan, which should not be used. So what is denosumab? If you get a case of GCT, you are likely to be asked about it. This came into limelight after a paper which was published in the Lancet after phase two studies were done when Chawla and his colleagues uh, checked the efficacy uh, and safety of this in about 35 patients, if I remember correctly, and they found that the risk of recurrence was very low in these patients. So what is denosumab? It is a monoclonal antibody to the rank ligand and it inhibits osteoclastogenesis or bone destruction in a similar fashion as the bisphosphonates. So if you guys want to take a picture of this slide, by all means, I can give you a pause. As I mentioned, the pathway is exactly similar to osteoporosis and denosumab works exactly similar to bisphosphonates. And it isn't just the uh, giant cells that causes problem, it's the stromal cells which causes recurrence. And it was these stromal cells on which denosumab works nicely. And in another study, they found that almost 90% of their cases responded well to denosumab treatment. So when should you use denosumab? That's the important question. If you have a patient where you deem this tumor to be unresectable, or if there is metastatic disease, or if there is grade three GCT, Campanacci grade three, or if there is progression and there is recurrence. Now, what does that mean? Just to sum it up clinically, I would suggest that if you have a patient who has a grade three GCT, those are the cases where you would use denosumab. And what it does is that it converts that jelly-like tumor into a solid tumor. And that makes it easy for you to either resect it completely and reconstruct it, or do a curettage and retain the joint. So what are the, uh, indic what are the doses of it? So remember 120 milligram is the recommended dose that we use and it's given in this regime. So I, I'd suggest you take a picture of this or write it down if you haven't got this anywhere in your books. So we give, give these patients a, an injection at day one, followed by day eight, then on day 15, and then after a fortnight on day 28. All four, 120 milligrams subcutaneously, okay? And then what you do is that if you are planning to do joint preservation surgery, following your fourth dose, you should go within two to three weeks to do your thorough curettage and whatever adjunct that you're going to use to reconstruct. Because if you leave it for long, these tumors become rock hard and it is impossible for you to curette them out. On the contrary, if you're planning to do a resection, outright resection, and then a replacement or reconstruction with whatever, we then can give them another dose after a month of the fourth dose and then do the resection or you wait for two to three weeks after the fourth dose, the day 28 dose, and you can do a resection because it gives you clear margin. So that's the beauty of denosumab. There was one study published which suggested that the risk of recurrence with denosumab treatment was lower in patients who had resection and reconstruction in comparison to patients who had curettage. So that is an important point and some certain literature which is coming up now is suggesting the same as well. However, you might have some patients 
in whom you might find that it is not curable or resectable. For instance, I have a few patients where the tumor has involved the whole of the sacrum and it's impossible to remove this tumor completely unless we resect the sacrum completely, which will cause major morbidities in terms of bowel bladder dysfunction. And those are the patients in whom we're using long-term denosumab. However, we don't know the exact outcomes of these. Um, but the dosage is the same and we give them 120 milligrams every three months. This is uh, a PET scan which shows uh, the response of the tumor, uh, the GCT, to uh, denosumab treatment. So on the picture on the left side, you can see the SUV max, which is the common term, term or the indicator that is used to tell you whether a lesion is malignant or not, or it is uh, aggressive or not. Um, so the SUV max prior to the treatment was 11. Following treatment, it has come down to four. So that shows uh, actually a good response to the tumor. There are certain controversies in giant cell tumors, as we've suggested that in the longer run, we don't know what are the side effects of it. They can cause hypocalcemia. Uh, they can cause uh, atypical fractures like with the bisphosphonates. And if a patient has been on denosumab for a long time, and if you stop that, there is a concern that the recurrence will be far more aggressive. And if there is recurrence, if you give them a repeat challenge of denosumab, will that give the same response or not? We don't know yet. One thing that's important is that if you are prescribing it to somebody, you need to mention it to them that they should not get pregnant whilst they are on treatment because it causes stillbirth. And all these patients should have dental checks. Uh, because they can cause dental problems or osteonecrosis of the jaw. So all the side effects uh, which are common to bisphosphonates are similar for denosumab as well. Cost is a major issue. Uh, in Pakistan, it is uh, available with the name of Prolia. I think it is somewhere in the range of 45 to 50,000 for 120 milligrams. So I've already discussed surgery with you. So if you are planning to do curettage, uh, you should do it within two to three weeks after your fourth dose. Uh, if you are planning uh, re outright resection and reconstruction, then you can wait for another couple of weeks. So your curettage should be detailed. There are various adjuvants that can be used as we've discussed uh, previously. So in conclusion, denosumab is an effective drug for managing GCTs of the bone, but it should be used in caution and should be used by people who know what they're dealing with and who knows the complications of it. Now, I've mentioned uh, uh, the term, it should be with caution uh, for uh, first-line treatment in patients who have inoperable or metastatic GCT. Uh, the, the, the caution here is because we do not know yet about the long-term side effects of it. So this is uh, one case on the plain radiograph on the left side. You can see that there was a, a giant cell tumor and somebody had put in a, a DHS through it. This patient consulted me. He was a young, I think, 28 or 29 years old patient. And I prescribed them denosumab. And as you can see on the x-ray on the right side, that lesion has nicely consolidated with a nice rim of new bone forming all around it. And I was then able to resect the tumor with clear margins and reconstruct it with a bipolar head because the patient was young and I wanted to get the most out of the acetabulum. Again, another patient with a grade 3 plus GCT uh, of the distal radius. And you can see now that the uh, tumor has consolidated very nicely after uh, denosumab treatment. And I was able to resect the tumor completely and then do the reconstruction. I've shown you this case already. So in summary, it, it is a common disorder 
uh, and a very common case scenario for your exam. Uh, common in 20 to 40 years old patients. Common in proximal tibia, distal femur, distal radius and proximal humerus. Uh, remember, if you just memorize this, as a lytic, expensile, juxta-articular, eccentric lesion, it has to be a giant cell tumor. But always remember, there is a malignant variety of GCT. So always biopsy. Do not assume that this is a GCT. The workup is exactly the same. And in grade three, the recurrence rate is as high as 50%. Detailed intralesional curettage, as I mentioned to you, with the use of some adjuvant is the mainstay of treatment. Cement provides immediate stability, and it has also shown that the heat that is produced with it will cause some tumor necrosis as well. 2% of these tumors will metastasize. They will still, however, remain benign. We've already discussed about the malignant variety. So GCT is, is a disease which is evolving. The, uh, the information about denosumab is coming through. Um, it is something which was considered as that magical drug, but there are concerns that are being raised with it. Uh, so I hope I've given you some clues, some idea about the management of giant cell tumor and what a detailed intralesional curettage is and the indications of denosumab. Uh, because uh, the last two set of residents uh, from our unit who went for exam, uh, all of them were asked about GCT and denosumab. So make sure you know about this. Sir, regarding systemic uh, 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 staging, in a primary bone tumor, should be in a GCT and in the uh, malignant. In a GCT, should we uh, uh, go for a bone scan and a, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis? And in the primary osteosarcoma, like in the malignant type, should we uh, go for the CT scan abdomen pelvis or just the CT scan of the lung and the bone scan? So uh, that is where the role of MDT actually comes in and answers your questions and your cries for help. So if you have a bog standard GCT, uh, all you need to do is to uh, perform local staging. You don't need to progress any further from there and then plan your biopsy. However, if your biopsy comes in in complete contradiction to what you guys thought of, then that is the time where you need to do your systemic staging. Okay, so that's the answer to the first part of your question. The second part is if you have biopsied it and that biopsy has given you a malignant variety of giant cell tumor or an osteosarcoma, then definitely you need to do the rest of the systemic staging. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, sir? It, should it include should it include the CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis too, or uh, it is only for the metastasis? No, only for metastatic disease. Uh, sir, uh, besides uh, denosumab, is there any role of other anti osteoporotic drugs, just like bisphosphonates, in the treatment of GCT? Okay, so it was used in the past. Some people have tried it. Uh, I could not find any convincing scientific evidence of uh, a good case series or a randomized control trial. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't think I would be brave enough to do an RCT on bisphosphonates, comparing it with denosumab at the moment, but in future I might after I get all the ethical approvals. Uh, but as, as we stand for now, um, it's not got any uh, role as yet when you compare it to denosumab. Any other questions? I think we've had a, 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 a very interesting session. I think we need to let Zishan Saab go. Uh, whatever questions you have, you can always post them to me and I'll ask Zishan directly for you. But I will save this video and, and we will actually go this back to reference. I think this is probably all you need to know for your tumor part of your exam. I think we've had a very good discussion. Um, we should all thank uh, uh, Zishan Saab for giving us two and a half hours. He promised me 45 and it's above and beyond the call of duty. My pleasure, Munawar Saab. Uh, I enjoy teaching as much as you do. And every time when you co uh, correspond with these uh, residents, I learn something myself as well.
Um, and I, I do agree what we've discussed is probably all that you need to know to uh, get you cruise through uh, your vivas. Um, and I hope I wasn't boring or monotonous. I tried to put in as many pictures uh, as I could. And that was a very good presentation. Very good. We all we all enjoyed it. So, guys, but before we finish, just one quick question. I think you've all had enough, so we won't do CP tonight and and gate tonight. We'll do it first thing tomorrow morning. When you guys are ready or for your time, just text me on the WhatsApp forum, and we'll get together with CP and and gate. But remember, tomorrow, um, uh, Kazim and, and Sufyan are going to do soft tissue knees. And I think Zaid Askar Sahib has said that he may come in and talk about posterior lateral corner, like I said. But but let's 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 have a chill out there. Go and have a cup of tea. Enjoy yourself. Give some time to your family. And thank you again, Zishan, for joining us. I mean, that was excellent. That was really good. That was very good. Thank you so much, thank, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful.